My name is Tatanan. It's my pleasure to be a moderator for today's seminar entitled Diagnostic Success Story in Pre- and Postnatal Tests at Greenwood Genetics Center. I have a few housekeeping notes to make before we begin today's program. First, I would like to seek your cooperation in completing this seminar, kindly switch your mobile phones to silent mode to avoid interruption. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. At this time, I'd like you to introduce you to a very important speaker, Dr. Alga Shaube, the director of Cytogenetics Laboratory, Greenwood Genetics Center. Dr. Shaube is responsible for overseeing the routine cytogenetics and molecular cytogenetics testing performed in the cytogenetics laboratory. Dr. Shaube is also currently involved in the interpretation of microRNA test results as well as several research projects. She is double board certified in cytogenetics and molecular genetics by the American Board of Medical Genetics. Today, Dr. Shelby will be our speaker for today's topic entitled Cytoscan Exxon, the new CMA test. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Alka Shaube. So I'm going to try this too. Swadika, was that good? Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. So, um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. This is my disclaimer. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do today is to walk you through about the kind of testing that we do primarily in the United States, um, following certain guidelines. And, um, and because I'm here, we have a new platform, which is called Cytoscan Exxon, and how it complements uh, next generation sequencing technologies, which you all must have heard about the hype, and we do a lot of complementing uh, technologies at Greenwood Genetics Center. And then I also want to show with respect to using different vendors and different platforms, what are the advantages and how do we address the issues of false positives and false negatives versus other platforms? Because that becomes a huge issue when we are kind of like, you know, trying to be a provider, doing laboratory testing, but essentially we are trying to give answers to patients and families and the referring physicians and they should understand what the advantages and limitations of each technology is. And finally, for those of you that are sitting in the audience associated with uh, seeing patients, I have a number of case examples. Um, some uh, fetal case examples and some postnatal examples uh, showing the advantages of multiple technologies. And then I'll summarize in the end. So uh, you heard from the title slide that I'm from Greenwood Genetic Center. So where is Greenwood Genetic Center? So I want to show you, uh, this is an aerial view of our building over here. And I think you can probably appreciate this is a very weird shape. So the whole thing is that uh, historically, Greenwood Genetic Center had a focus on X-linked intellectual disability or X-linked mental retardation. So I don't know if you have seen the book uh, written by Dr. Roger Stevenson. And he's actually the founder of GGC. So this building was supposed to be an X chromosome, but we didn't get enough funding for it. So kind of it's a weird shape. But if we get additional funding, it may end up being an X or a Y, depending on you know, how much funding we get for it. This is kind of like a joke that I start off with. So, but as you can see, this is a very beautiful um, campus, beautiful location. And um, so as I was uh, telling you that Greenwood Genetic Center was founded in 1974. And um, the kind of services that we have, we have laboratory services, 
but we also have clinical services. So what does that mean? This is the state of South Carolina. It is right above Florida and Georgia and North Carolina on the east coast of the United States. So we have our main headquarters are in Greenwood, but we have offices in Greenville, Charleston, Columbia, and Florence, which are these highlighted regions over here. And we have clinical geneticists who are basically pediatricians and uh, board certified in clinical genetics. And we have genetic counselors that see patients and families across the state. And the samples are sent to Greenwood for us to do laboratory testing. We also have a research division. So as I was mentioning, historically, the focus has been birth defects, autism, and, and, and X-linked intellectual disability, which we are trying to find answers for that. So the other little snippet is that of all the genes on the X chromosome that have been associated with mental retardation or intellectual disability, um, almost 60% of the genes have some association with GGC. So either it's patients and families um, that were sent for testing elsewhere, or the testing and the technologies used were at Greenwood to identify the genes. Along with that, we have an education program too. So um, as the moderator was mentioning, we, our lab is also accredited by American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics. So we have laboratory fellowships and we have clinical genetics fellowships. And then after the fellowship program, um, the, the lab, uh, the trained fellows can take the board exam and then become certified by, you know, we can become diplomats or fellow of um, American College of Medical Genetics. So those kind of um, ac uh, credentials give us the license in the United States to run clinical laboratories. So this is just an overview of uh, we have a complete package with respect to testing and seeing patients and families. So it becomes really very um, you know, cohesive nature of um, laboratory testing at Greenwood Genetic Center. So my primary fellowship was in cytogenomics. So I like to call myself a cytogenomicist because molecular genetics I did secondary. And I feel that molecular genetics people cannot understand cyto, but cyto people can understand both. So, you know, there's a little advantage over there. So primarily, we obviously, uh, we do a lot of conventional cytogenetics. We do karyotyping, we do fish, and we uh, kind of cater to all kind of samples, prenatal, postnatal, and oncology. And following NCCN and World Health Organization guidelines, we have a number of fish panels for stat samples like CML or APML for 1517 translocation and so on and so forth. But we all know the limitations of conventional cytogenetics and the limit of resolution of these technologies. So we have a number of microarray platforms. And I think um, as we go through my talk, you'll be able to appreciate why we have all these multiple platforms. The reason is that they all have their utility with respect to either the sample type or the indication for use. So, or um, what is the clinical significance of using these technologies? Along with that, um, we not only serve South Carolina, but I'm also the scientific director for uh, Georgia Regents University or Augusta University, which is in the neighboring state in uh, Augusta, Georgia. So it's a medical hospital. Um, so we are also the scientific directors of that lab. So we do remote sign outs for those cases. Um, as part of the laboratory testing at Greenwood Genetic Center, we have the cytogenetics lab, we have the molecular diagnostic lab, and then we also have a biochemical genetics lab. So I'm involved with molecular and cyto. So I haven't put a slide for biochemical because uh, besides just the word biochemical genetics, I, I don't know anything else with respect to mass spec and things like that. But uh, for the, again, uh, the reason for referral of patients or the clinical suspicion of single gene disorders where single nucleotide variants or mutation testing is 
90% or greater responsible. So then we start off with um, you know, molecular testing. It could be Sanger, or it could be smaller next-gen panels. Or now, we actually have moved everything to whole exome sequencing. That is our basic platform. And based on the reason for referral, the data analysis is sliced and diced. So if a patient comes in for connective tissue disorder or autism, then we slice and dice that. But the advantage is that the testing doesn't need to be repeated if we have to analyze additional genes on those panels. So there's a utility over there, and I'm going to kind of show you and walk you through as to how it becomes really important for us to um, kind of unite different technologies to have a nice package for patients and uh, families. Um, this is just a little bit of um, you know additional information that I'm a big, big proponent of the Applied Biosystems platform. And, and I can say this with a lot of confidence because one, I am a, a user, so I'm not an employee of Thermo Fisher, and they didn't pay me to come here. Just so you know, they should pay me to come here, right? But they didn't. But anyway, so basically, um, one of the things that um, I was uh, really amazed at is I was also involved in their FDA clearance uh, of their Cytoscan DX microarray. And it involved a lot of work regarding validation and verification and how to come up with a robust platform that is uh, reliable, reproducible, and has very high fidelity. So that's extremely important. And why is that important? Because when we talk about specificity, sensitivity, accuracy, and precision, which are the four basic parameters any CAP or CLIA accredited lab has to demonstrate for an LDT or a laboratory developed test, it becomes really important that we have really high specificity and sensitivity for any assay that we offer as a diagnostic test. So with that, um, I just want to spend a few minutes on this slide. So this kind of like tells you a little bit about the things that I'm involved with personally. So we have conventional uh, cytogenetics over here, which you can see, which involves um, routine chromosomes and targeted fish assays. Then we have the constitutional microarray, which is the cytoscan assay. And then we have the FDA cleared version, we have the non-FDA cleared version, we have cytoscan exon, and we have oncoscan. So when we look at um, uh, another, which platform can we use for heme malignancies? So if we get in leukemias and lymphomas, which platform can we use? Can we use oncoscan? No. But can we use cytoscan? Yes. Uh, but if we get formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, now we know that that DNA will be of really inferior quality, very short fragments. And if we get DNA from fetal tissues, for example, products of conception or fetal demise, then that DNA may be really degraded. In that situation, can we run cytoscan? No, we can run oncoscan. But what is the advantage? The advantage is that now we have one instrumentation where we can cater to any number of platforms and, and the specimen type that comes in to provide answers. Along with that, as part of our next-gen panels, we are required to also do deletion duplication analysis. So as part of our workflow, and I have a slide to demonstrate that, uh, what we essentially do is that we now need a deletion duplication specific microarray which can actually have that much resolution at single exon level. And that is why I'm here because of Cytoscan Exxon. So again, some other standard tests that we have in the lab, which is fine. So I think what becomes really interesting with all this hype of you know, diagnostic testing, you go to any conference these days, 90% is loaded with just next gen, next generation sequencing, whole exome sequencing. So I remember in 2010 when next gen came in, it was like, well, every other technology is going to die, right? Because next gen is going to replace everything. Well, let me tell you one thing. Eight years later, I'm standing here talking about Cytoscan Exxon. Why? Because there are limitations to next generation sequencing with the things that they can and cannot do. And I'll show you some examples of that. So what have we actually done? 
If you look at the, the stats and papers from 1980s, any 50% of clinical genetics referrals were undiagnosed. What does that mean? If 100 P patients came in using all the technologies available at that time, we could only give an answer to 50 patients. Well, guess what? In 2016, and these are actually stats from a Nature paper, it's still 55 to 56%. So what have we done? With all these technologies, we have really increased the diagnostic yield by less than 10%. So we are still not able to provide answers to patients and families for majority of cases. And we need better tools to give that. So what are those tools? Let's go from there. So in 2010, which is you know, my career, a lot of work was done, a lot of publications, hundreds, thousands of publications demonstrating the clinical utility and yield of chromosomal microarray. And then came a landmark paper in Genetics in Medicine by Miller et al, which said that microarray should be the first year test for constitutional disorders. So what were we doing before that? Karyotyping and fragile X testing. A patient came into the clinic, had developmental delay, intellectual disability, dysmorphic features, seizures, autism, you name it. The two tests that were ordered in conjunction was fragile X testing and karyotyping. The diagnostic yield of both of them together was less than 5%. And microarray has a diagnostic yield of 20 to 25%. So soon, when this recommendation came, a lot of agencies like American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Neurology, ISCA, they all came on board and said, if a patient comes in your clinic, the first test should be microarray. If you find an answer, again, remember the diagnostic yield is very important, 20 to 25%, which is huge. Like they, there was no single test that would actually beat this. Now, I must also mention that when you read all these papers about next gen and whole exome, you read percentages like 50%, 70%. Remember, there is an ascertainment bias over there. Why? Because all these tests were actually negative. So microarray, karyotyping, those patients were negative by these. So what the bucket that is left is actually 50% of 50%. So it still hasn't crossed 25%. Is that making sense, the math? That what you have when you talk about these percentages, those percentages are really from a biased bucket. They are not really you know, uh, uh, a prospective study kind of situation. So at Greenwood, um, I just want to show you some pipelines. And, um, and towards the end, I'm going to show you another slide, which is going to remove this barrier. So this is before we had Cytoscan Exxon. So if a patient came in with developmental delay, intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies or dysmorphic features, which is the indications for use that FDA recommended for us to use Cytoscan DX, then the patient gets the DX platform, which is the FDA cleared version. Now it helps the labs because we have better reimbursement because insurance companies in the United States do not deny us because now we have the FDA label on it. So we try to provide the best assay for patients also because if the insurance company pays, then the patients and families do not get a bill. So, you know, it's kind of like in their best interest. If we have a pathogenic finding, a microdeletion or a microduplication, then the diagnostic odyssey of that patient ends. If we have a normal result or a variant of uncertain significance, then that patient may move on to whole exome sequencing or other, um, you know, sequencing-based assays. So, but if a patient comes in with not these features, but something like autism, or seizures or connective tissue disorder or name it like any other lysosomal storage disorder, then the patient might get a, the non-FDA version of Cytoscan. And again, the pipeline is pretty straightforward. You know, if we get a pathogenic finding, great. The diagnostic odyssey ends. And if not, then they follow to the whole exome sequencing. Now, what we started realizing very quickly is that there is a lot of information about algorithms in literature talking about copy number detection by next-gen assays. 
But when we started doing the validation and trying to pick up, well, how many of these, can this become a routine diagnostic pipeline? We saw no, it's really 10 to 15%. And the reason is because no next-gen technology can right now address the preferential bias of amplification. So you are, it's a hit or miss. The second allele may be picked up or may not be picked up. So we had to design a custom array so that we could pick up single exon deletion duplication. At that time, there was nothing else in the market, so I had to approach Agilent at that time because you know their array CGS technology can theoretically give us single exon resolution. Now the huge problems over there, I, I keep saying it was a nightmare for me in the lab. I have the scanner still sitting in the lab, which I don't use anymore because I'm just so happy to get rid of it. But um, it was so problematic to try to validate every call that Ray CGH was making because remember, now we are trying, our goal is different. Our goal is to not look for aneuploidies. Our goal is not to look for micro deletion. Our goal is can we pick up single exon resolution deletion duplication? And that was a huge problem. But we went by with it. Uh, what we did was we had a number of next-gen panels, so we added all the genes, which came to a total of 725 genes at that time, and we had them design this, uh, validating it was a problem, confirming everything with qPCR was a problem. It was really from the lab perspective. I can tell you my lab techs told me all the time, can we get rid of this? Can we get rid of this? And it was like, I don't have any answer, any other option right now. So we had to wait a little bit, and that's why I'm here. Now, that said, one thing that we cannot argue about is that an array is always going to be very useful for exon level CNVs, and there are a number of publications, open access, that are available in, in literature where whole exome array can be a very useful tool to confirm findings by whole exome sequencing. Now, remember, that percent is also going to be very low, so it's going to be actually for detection. But it's really important in autosomal recessive disorders where we only found one mutation uh, on a gene by sequencing, and the other call could be a deletion duplication on the other allele. Or also in autosomal dominant disorders where NGS is negative, and you'll be surprised because the kind of lab that we have, that we have all these three labs and all these different technologies, there are so many negative NGS results that we have been able to find answers using any microarray based methodology. So there is absolutely no question, no argument over how reliable this platform is. So, but if NGS does find a CNV, there are recommendations that you have to confirm it with another finding. So essentially something like if you find a, a, um, a variant, a single nucleotide variant by NGS, are you going to confirm by Sanger? And if yes, for how long? What is the allele frequency by Sanger, uh, by NGS? And then does it match? So every lab has set dif different thresholds. If your variant allele frequency is 35% to 60%, you are confident that every time you do a Sanger, it's going to confirm, then you move on. The problem becomes when you have calls like a deletion or a homozygous change, then you, when you do Sanger, the nomenclature of that change changes invariably 70% of the time. This is, my, this is my experience coming from the lab. But the technologies that are routinely used are something like MLPA. So MLPA is a technology that uh, you know every run requires several controls, number one. A large gene like DMD doesn't even fit onto one uh, MLPA assay. So we need to run two assays if it comes in for a DMD gene, and there are some other genes like that too. And the per exon cost now suddenly goes up. And first, and the third thing is, it's really not comprehensive. So if you have an NGS panel or a whole exome panel, then it's, and then it's not that useful either. So 
the, the other thing that some labs have is a custom del dupe design. Now, what is the problem? So this is where I can tell you really personal um, challenges. First of all, you know, every day, the list of medically relevant genes is increasing. So what does that mean? We have to update our panel. So if the first validation is such a huge burden, imagine what happens if we add 10 more genes six months later, 100 more genes, another six months later, we have to do that whole validation again. And so the lab management efficiency, cost, time, everything becomes exponentially increased and a lot of paperwork. So at that time, when we were struggling with all this, and I really didn't want to do another validation of my custom Del Dupe 725 gene panel, OGT approached us, Oxford Gene Technology. And even at that time, Cytoscan Exxon was not there. So they approached us and they said, you know what? I have, we have this 1 million array, which is the medical research exome array, has 4,600 genes on it. We want you to validate it. And I said, sure, because in the best interest of patients and families, I'm not going to be biased towards a vendor, even though I know that Thermo Fisher and Applied Biosystem have, to have the most robust platform. But you know what? I don't have any other solution, so let's just run it. So I'm going to show you some data in the next few slides that the high false, false positive rate was just a nightmare. And it was two and a half times more expensive than our smaller microarray. And again, only 4,600 genes. So if you look at all the genes in the human genome and the way associations are being made in OMIM and other phenotypic syndromes, it's really not future proofed. But well, so what I did, what happened was we ran samples and we got the data. And when I got the data, on an average, the calls ranged from 200 to 900 calls in every sample, which is fine if I was going to do cheating in my validation. I could just go to my call and say, yep, I see it, boom, click, done. The problem is that kind of cheating will only help us in validation. When I get a real patient sample in and I have 200 calls, remember these are all known clinically relevant genes, what do I do then? How many qPCRs am I going to get done? One, to confirm it. Two, how am, I, how am I going to have an association of that gene with the phenotype with those high number of calls? So they came to my office and they sat and said, well, you know, you've run these samples and we want your business. And I said, okay, you want my business? I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm going to give you all these 30 files. Give me your cloud information. I'll upload everything onto the FTP. And now you tell me, use your experts, give me the top 20 calls on every sample. And I will tweak the algorithm, do whatever you need to do. I'll be happy with that. 18 months, total silence. Those files are still sitting with them, and they don't have an answer. So at that time, I approached, you know, I have a very good working relationship with Thermo Fisher, and I approached them and I said, you know, you guys really need to do this because you have a very good platform, you have a very good single color chemistry, and it's a single chip, so it's not a CGH, the bias goes away, and we have, uh, we run these samples with in silico controls, there are so many advantages, can you please make something and it will be really worth worth it. So that's where this happened. And so now I'm going to talk about Cytoscan Exxon. So this was a lot of you know, things that still go on at Greenwood Genetic Center. So the way that this content uh, was designed was 48 million copy number probes from their database and 1.5 million SNP probes from their database were empirically selected across the genome to choose the best 6.85 million performing probes. And this also has 300,000 SNP probes. Now remember, there's a reason. This was to get it to the single exon level resolution to have reliable calls, okay? The other thing that they did was, well, since we are talking about the limitations of the existing platforms, now this platform covers 26,000 genes in the human genome. But, so now you will say, well, is this not a nightmare for you? How are you going to analyze these? 
Well, they did another smart thing. All these genes are now divided into level one through level four. So level one are all OMIM genes, uh, OMIM morbid genes associated with the phenotype. Level two are ClinVar genes. So that, are, that you know, some labs have found an association, but functional studies are not available, but there is a strong implication with the phenotype. Level three are other um, OMIM genes that don't have a phenotype association. And level four are all the other RefSeq genes. So when you add all these together, this is 26,000 genes in the human genome. Then they did another smart thing. For the level one genes, not only is the target exon covered, but 500 uh, base pairs of the flanking region is covered. So now, you know, genes like FOXP1 or other genes where we know that promoter deletions can be responsible for the phenotypic consequence, those genes have this kind of coverage. Now, the other genes where we don't have, because you know, that once, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but the Affymetrix chip or the applied biosystems chip is one centimeter by one centimeter square. And that square, there's only so much real estate you can put on it. I'm amazed that they put 6.85 million probes on it. I don't think there's a, any like micrometer dot left where they could have squeezed in more probes. But just like very powerful. So the other thing that the point I want to make is that on this slide, I already told you about the probe content, there's full coverage of 22,000 genes. Every exon from this list is covered. And you can do an analysis in the software with the, with the click of like four clicks and you get to your gene panel. It's just that powerful. But the, the take home message from this slide is the sensitivity that I was talking about. You look at next gen making copy number calls, nothing reaches this high sensitivity. And this is extremely important, one, from the lab perspective if we want to run an assay, two, from the physician perspective if you want a very good answer for your patients and families, and three, from the vendor perspective that you know that you have a future-proofed product for at least the next five years. Any association doesn't matter, it's covered on the platform. So it's something like whole exome or whole genome. The labs in the United States that are currently offering whole genome assays, they are actually only analyzing the whole exome. But the, the good thing is that in the next five to 10 years, that data is still there, so the assay doesn't need to be run. Cytoscan Exxon offers that kind of coverage and resolution that you have the whole genome covered, but you really don't have to repeat the assay. You know, six months later, if I see a gene or if a physician calls me, hey, Alka, you know, I ordered 100 genes. Can you look at 10 more for me? It's not a problem. I open the file and I look at those 10 extra genes and I give the answer. So this really allows us to do a lot of reanalysis without running the assay, without putting an extra cost of burden on the lab and the patients and families. So how did we uh, solve the false positive conundrum, right? Which is what I'm talking about from the lab perspective. Um, so this is what I was essentially telling you, that what we did was that we took five samples on which we have run the MRE array, the Medical Research Exome Array by Oxford Gene Technology, and we ran those same samples on Cytoscan Exxon. And when we did a direct comparison, first thing is that you can see that the number of calls went down like twofold, first of all, from almost 500 to 185. But really, is this a fair comparison? Is this an apples to apples comparison? No, because remember, Cytoscan Exxon has 26,000 genes and MRE has 4,600 genes. So what happens when we do an apples to apples comparison? So now we filtered the Cytoscan Exxon calls, which matched the 4,600 genes on MRE. Now the calls went down by 11, 11 fold. This is huge, you know, for a lab from analysis interpretation perspective. Now, you would have a question for me that did you miss your call of choice from this list? The answer is no. That's how good it is. So, you know, this, is, this was a blinded comparison that we did a study, and this was just phenomenal. So this is an example of a case where you know uh, it came in, and KIF7 is a is a brain uh, gene. Uh, you know it's associated with neurodevelopment, 
And what happened was that this loss in this KIF7 gene was picked up by both the Agilent, my uh, custom array, and also by Cytoscan Exxon. But guess what? When we ran Cytoscan Exxon, the deletion was not just this small. The deletion included five exons. So this, this region was actually called a false negative by Agilent. So we missed that. Right Now, what you see here at the bottom is this huge numbers, right? You can see one. One tells you that this is a level one gene. So this is an important gene. So when I was telling you that these genes, this whole genome is now divided into four levels, it's so easy when you open the software to even see which level your gene is in and whether it has any phenotypic association. So what happened, let's take an example of a false positive. So a patient came in with a clinical suspicion of uh, Angelman syndrome, and the gene that is associated with that is UB3A on chromosome 15. And so Agilent obviously made a call of a two exon deletion, which we again spent a lot of money and effort in trying to confirm it by qPCR, and it did not. But, but see, when we ran the same sample on Cytoscan exon, it was just clean. So this was a false positive by Agilent that we were able to address with um, the Cytoscan Exxon. Now, there are a lot of examples like this. I just picked the best ones, which I knew the clinical information on. So the, the next step was, well, OK. Um, all these calls are there with these two platforms. But what is really going on with respect to the calls that are made by both Cytoscan Exxon and by other, other vendors? So we took two samples and decided to confirm every call uh, made by these two platforms by qPCR. And so we are a nonprofit lab, okay? Greenwood Genetic Center is not for profit. So there are at least 50% of our lab referrals that we write off every month. But the way, the way that we are able to do that is we get state funding. The state has realized that providing these genetic services to the patients of South Carolina, the residents of South Carolina, saves a lot of uh, money. So they give us money to perform this kind of testing. So, but we still try to keep the cost low. So uh, in my lab, we, our, our qPCR method uses the cyber method. It's a little less specific than TACMAN, but you can see that when we use the same uh, aberrations called by these two vendors, 8% versus 82%. Even if we go to TACMAN, it's still three times more with respect to confirmation. So if you imagine the number of calls that you will see on a Ray CGH platform, so again, you know, when I was doing all this and you know, we were we were giving Agilent some business, right, with the, with the custom design. And suddenly overnight, when I got Cytoscan X on, it became zero. So their VP came to Greenwood and said, what can we do to get your business? And I said, if you can give me a single color assay with 6.85 million probes, then let's talk again. So you know they were like really quiet about that. And then I said, but I have to tell you, it's not your problem. It's a flaw in the technology. Those Psi-3 and Psi-5 dyes, you can keep up upgrading their version. Hey, we tweak the Psi-3, we tweak the Psi-5. It's just not going to work that well. And we need to have a better platform, a really reliable platform, to, to do the best uh, genetic testing possible. So as I was mentioning to you that because I have pretty much access to all the platforms for genomic testing, all the softwares that are available for analysis and interpretation, I promise you in my experience, I have all of them on my desktop, by the way, um, Chaz is the best software that I have, I have yet to see. Even Illumina has nothing that matches this. It is just so good, so user friendly. It's like the iPhone, right? No matter how much you praise Android, doesn't matter. You know, I mean, and I give the example of my mom. You know, my mom got an uh, Apple iPhone and she just started to navigate through it like easy. So it's Chaz is the same way. 
clinicians, technologists, lab people, distributors, lab directors, you open CHAS, you'll just see everything and you'll be like, hey, let me click this, let me click this, and you just see the answers in front of you. It is just extremely user friendly. They did another good thing uh, with you know updating this because now with Cytoscan Exxon, there, are, there is an option to click level one, level two, level three, level four. So I can tell you that we launched this in November. Until now, I've only been analyzing level one genes, which is 7,000 genes. It's still more than OGT's 4,600 genes. Very useful. Now there is an, uh, a way to also import a VCF file if you have next-gen data especially for autosomal recessive disorders, if there is one change that we found, then we can just go to our gene panel and see if the other change is there. Now, I will say the disclaimer is I haven't used the VCF um, uh, part in CHAS yet. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time on this because now I think all everybody here knows that is extremely high resolution with uh, enormous amount of coverage, entire genome is covered, and extremely, extremely flexible analysis. So now comes the important part, right? Because you all want to hear these nice cases that I have. So one of the questions that we got uh, from the clinicians and one of the challenges that we posed to Thermo Fisher when we were developing this was, we need to be able to pick up homozygous calls. Can we do that, right, consistent with the phenotype? So the first research case that I want to talk to you about, and I'll tell you another thing, is that this uh, case has been accepted for publication in the American Journal of Medical Genetics. And once it's open access, I will make sure that uh, Pikun and other people have the link so you guys can get access to it. So this is actually the mother. And you can see this heterochromia, this differently covered, um, colored eyes, and this little hypopigmentation over here. The husband of this woman was also um, affected, you know, also had the streak of white hair, uh, clinical, like, you know, hallmark feature of Wardenberg syndrome. They had a, a stillborn fetus. Okay, so it was lethality pretty much in utero, and the fetus, you know, when the fetus was born, all white hair, pretty much like Wardenberg syndrome. So we actually ran the um, um, microarray on the fetal sample first. So what we saw was a large deletion involving the SOX10 gene. So there are five Wardenberg syndrome types, and there are different genes associated with it. So SOX10 is associated with Wardenberg syndrome 2 and, and 4. So the next step was we only found one change because now we, we had a suspicion of autosomal recessive phenotype. So we had a small Wardenberg syndrome panel of these five genes, no findings. You'll find this really weird, and if anybody asks me a question, I'll answer later on. We did whole exome sequencing because at that time, our backbone was not whole exome. We were actually really running smaller panels. We didn't find any sequence findings, so we put this on Cytoscan Exxon. So I want to show you here. So first of all, this is the large deletion, okay, which we found with another platform. So you can see here the probes, the log2 probes have shifted down over here, and this is the breakpoint of the deletion. Perfect, matched perfectly with our previous finding. We were, ha we were happy. And then we saw this little shift, this extra shift down here, which shows that this could be a homozygous deletion. So now we have a large deletion and we have a small nested homozygous deletion within the deletion. So we did uh, quantitative PCR testing on the parents. We had the parental samples, and we saw that the large deletion came, came from the mother, and the small deletion came from the father. And that's how this was a lethal phenotype and autosomal recessive. So um, the importance of this is that this is the first report of a biallelic deletion responsible for a Wardenberg syndrome phenotype, and that's why it was accepted without any issues. So how many of these kind of phenotypes are we really missing, you know, in the prenatal and the postnatal scenario? That is something that we didn't have the tools to have these kind of answers, and now we will. So that's one big win, right? Homozygous CNVs. So one of the questions that one of actually our clinicians are, are super, super smart too. 
like all of you here. And so one of the clinicians said, well, can you pick up partial exonic CNVs? And I was really skeptical. I was like, I'm not going to make a claim for this. But, you know, we had 10 alpha study samples. And so the answer, which you can see, is yes, we can. So this is another research case that we were trying to solve at the Greenwood Genetic Center for uh, the past 10 years. Let me tell you that, you know, it's just amazing. So clearly, the phenotype was craniosynostosis. So we had a craniosynostosis panel, again, you know, because this case was followed up for 10 years. And that tells you that the patients whose diagnostic odyssey we were not able to end in the past 10 years, now we have the ability to do that. So obviously, there were no findings. Uh, when we did whole exome sequencing, we found a lot of benign variants, but they were also present in the uh, uh, sample from the dad. So we ran this on Cytoscan exon. Oops. So, okay, it popped up together. So we, the three genes that are associated with craniosynostosis, all of you are aware, is FGFR1, FGFR2, and FGFR3. So when we looked at all those three genes, negative. But, you know, we started looking, well, now we have this enormously high-resolution platform. Let's look at some associated pathway genes. Is it something upstream or downstream of FGFRs, and could that be clinically relevant? So I have a staff scientist in my lab, super smart, and so what he thought was, well, before we go to the pathway, let's look at all the other FGFRs. So what we saw was, hmm, there's this little shift in the log to ratio towards the end of this gene, which you, when you zoom in, you see over here, right? You can all see the shift, the downward shift of the log to probes. And this is part of exon 18. So it's not the entire exon 18. And so, and, but this is FGFR4. FGFR4 has been associated with cancer, but not with the constitutional disorder. So first of all, did we find a new gene associated with craniosynostosis? So we are still doing some functional studies and some qPCR assays to test the parents and try to figure this out. But regardless, the beauty here is that we can pick up exonic CNVs, partial exonic CNVs, and we confirm this with qPCR. So I was like ecstatic when I show this case. I just think it just tells you, shows you the power of where, how, how low you can go to pick up these calls. The other question was, we know that, you know, we are really spoiled, right? We have the HD platform, which has 750,000 SNPs. And now this only has 300,000 SNPs. So how does this fare? But you know, Illumina, Illumina's platform doesn't have 750,000 SNPs. And Agilent and OGT can't even go beyond 60, right? I mean, they're just, they're just, uh, they can't do it with their slide and their real estate. They just can't. So one of the questions was, well, what about UPDs and mosaicism? And I promise you, this is not a made up slide that, you know, hey, I just picked the best cases. As part of the alpha study, I sent 10 samples. Now remember, these were undiagnosed samples, followed at GGC for 10 years. So they went through, again, the same bucket, remember, which I was telling you in the beginning, that you've got all these technologies which were negative, and then I put them on Cytoscan Exxon. And I have three hits out of 10. And it's phenomenal, one homozygous deletion, one partial exonic deletion, one UPD, and then not just UPD, mosaic UPD. So I, I actually stand and, and ask my clinicians, does this mean that the diagnostic yield goes up by 30%? I wish. It's, that's, not going, that's not how it's going to be, because there is ascertainment bias in these samples, because they're negative by other technologies. So what I want to show you here is that this is the CHAS view. So at the top, you see the LOC2 probes. And this blue line shows you the smooth signal, which tells you that this is a copy number state of 2. But then the SNP probes, remember, there are only 300,000, but it's a lot of probes. Uh, what you see here is the SNPs being uh, uh, demarcated by allele difference. And of course, Thermo Fisher is really smart. Now, they also have B allele frequency in there. So now you can really pick up extremely low-level mosaicism. 
So now what you see here is this is chromosome 6P. So 6P, entire P, mosaic UPD. So if we had lost this heterozygosity over here and only saw the BB and the AA, I would have said straightforward 6P isodisomy. But because I see the split over here, and you can appreciate in both tracks, this is actually mosaic UPD. So, well, I mean, this is like a double whammy, right? Not only UPD, but mosaic UPD, and that to partial uh, chromosome 6. So we are still trying to figure out so on chromosome 6, P, there are a number of genes you know, associated with um, some blood, blood cell type. And this family that we've been trying to follow has some like, you know, blood disorder in the family. But we still don't know exactly what's going on. But remember, 6P P is a huge region of the genome. So we're still trying to tweak that out. So uh, while we were doing this constitutional validation, it was, um, uh, I give this example, buy one, get one free example. I was doing my constitutional validation, but I'm also involved with the hereditary cancer next-gen panel development at Greenwood Genetic Center. So as part of that, um, I have designed a 415-gene hereditary cancer panel. And of those, uh, we have 44 genes which form a guidelines-based um, expanded panel, which includes genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, Lin syndrome, um, and then TP53, and some other genes. Now, according to the guidelines for uh, germline testing of breast and ovarian cancer, there are common deletions and duplications in BRCA1, BRCA2 that need to be reported in every clinical report, at least in the United States. And it's important, right? I mean, it for, forms a significant percentage. So I thought, well, while I'm doing this, you know, it is hereditary cancer. Let me see what kind of coverage we have. So um, we just randomly took these 44 genes, created a bet file, and we saw that all the genes had coverage, more than 150 probes per gene, no gaps. So I had four samples in my lab, you know, positive samples, BRCA1, BRCA2 gains. So I thought, let me just put these as part of my validation samples, and all of them confirmed. So I got a hereditary cancer validation in with my constitutional cancer validation, uh, constitutional panel validation. So this was like a win-win situation. So since I've been harping the glory of CHAZ, uh, and of course, it's not mine, it's their product, but I just love it. So when you open CHAS, what you see on the left side is the different tracks. And here what you see is the whole genome view, and this is actually your probes, that you will actually see the log2 probes and your SNP probes. So when I open the BRCA1 uh, sample, what I can do is when I open the array, actually in the whole genome, there were 47 calls, right? So now I open my target list of genes because I'm not interested in the 26,000. I'm only interested in my 44 genes. And there is a right click over here, and I think uh, maybe the Thermo guys can show you if you're interested, where you can select that only show me the calls in my list of genes. And when you do that and you do filter, what you get is just one call, BRCA1. And when you click on that call, this is the call. Now, BRCA1 gene is here, this highlighted, remember, level 1, level 2? So the rest of the duplication involves neighboring region of BRCA1 gene. If you don't want to see it, you can actually mask it so you don't see this part from reporting perspective. So it makes reporting so much simpler and easier. So, so that's how easy it is. So now let me show you um, uh, two more very interesting case studies, which are really unique. So we all know the significance of uh, absence of heterozygosity, runs of homozygosity, or loss of heterozygosity, any of these three terms that you want to use. So I want to show you how we use the CytoScan platform for the, for the identification of segmental UPD, 14. So this was a two-day-old female that came in with suspected lethal skeletal dysplasia. And at Greenwood, we have another unique pro, uh, program. 
The unique program is that we have senior scholars that come in. So senior scholars from across the world, like Alistair Hunter of Hunter Syndrome, or um, Jurgen Spronger, the, the expert on you know, bone dysplasias, if you guys have read the book. Uh, Giovanni Neri, he's an Italian that comes in and you know, uh, biochemical disorders. Jules Leroy, he's a Belgian, 82 years old, phenomenal guy, like the eye cell disease guy. Uh, and Brian Hall, the, the dysmorphologist, right? Tom Sadler, the embryologist. So when I was a fellow, uh, and, I, and I did my fellowship at Greenwood, I was amazed when I was talk to my colleagues that, hey, you met these people in person? And I'm like, no, I just didn't meet them. They gave lectures. I actually heard their classes. So anytime we have a skeletal uh, disorder, Dr. Spronger, uh, he gets the x-rays because we have this collaboration. And you can see the x-rays of this baby, very sick baby. This baby has since then passed, uh, passed away. But you know, we sent the x-rays to him. And uh, he was consulted. So this is Dr. Spronger. And this is one of our genetic counselors. So Dr. Spronger looked at this and said, this looks like UPD-14 because the x-rays of the thorax match perfectly. Now, don't ask me what that is. I just showed you the photographs that I got from him. So it was like, well, Angie says, Dr. Spronger is always right, right? So what was the first thing we did? This was redundant. There was no need to do karyotype because it was not going to pick up anything. But still, there could have been a translocation that we would have missed. But we had a marker assay in the molecular lab to do microsatellite marker assay for UPD-14. When we did that, we saw biparental inheritance. So there could be two things going on. Because remember, Dr. Spronger said this is UPD-14. So one, there could be a microdeletion involving the imprinted region. That's why this was biparental inheritance based on the marker. Or there is another phenocopy, which is called June syndrome. So it could be that. So you know, when we were still discussing with Dr. Spronger, so the reason why we did the cytoscan was to see the microdeletion. Remember this. So what did we see? Well, when I opened chromosome 14, I saw this loss of heterozygosity in the Q terminal of chromosome 14. This is chromosome 14. So I thought, how is it that the molecular lab missed this? Because they call this biparental. So I went back to the UCSC genome browser, and I actually mapped all these markers. Now, you know, according to the guidelines, you need five to seven markers. This is a lot of markers that we had. And see how where they mapped? At the time when this assay was developed, the presumed imprinted region was this big. So we had enough markers in there. But this is the region that is uh, loss of heterozygosity. When I mapped it, now the differentially methylated region actually falls in this, this end. And we had no markers in this end in our molecular assay. So since then, it has been revised you know, by adding more markers in the 14Q arm. But we were able to, Dr. Spronger was right. This was segmental UPD, really tiny, but it was UPD-14. And we did confirm this. It was paternal UPD-14. So my last case that I want to show you, this is a very cute story. And I want to show you the limitation of next gen, which we all know about. Um, so this is an eight-month-old male that came in with keratoglobus and blue sclera. Such a cute baby. So one of our clinicians, Dr. Curtis Rogers in Greenville, saw this baby. And uh, his dad is actually um, a pastor. So Dr. Rogers goes to the same church. So they were like friends. So this, you know, like little cute little baby. And Dr. Rogers saw him and all these, like, you know, this... Um, um, uh, stria over here on his forehead and said, you know, it looks like he might have a connective tissue disorder. So at GGC, we have a number of next-gen panels, and so we have a connective tissue disorder panel, which had 31 genes. So this uh, baby was run on the connective tissue disorder panel, and we thought that there was a homozygous one base pair uh, deletion in this baby. Now, autosomal recessive. So the first thing was, let's do mom and dad. We tested mom and dad by Sanger. Guess what? Only mom had the change, the single base pair deletion. But see, this looked like a homozygous deletion, a single base pair deletion. So dad was negative. So we called the clinician, and he said, wait, no. 
I am not calling the dad and talking about paternity here because, you know, that's one of the things you have to discuss. And so, well, what can you do? And I said, well, we have Cytoscan. Let's run that. So when we ran Cytoscan, uh, do you see? There is a deletion, a large deletion, including the entire gene, ZNF469, not just one base pair deletion on the other allele. Then we did qPCR, and guess what? The deletion is coming from the father, mutation from the mother, and this kid has brittle cornea syndrome. And so now, this kid is only, was only eight months old, but this result allowed us to put proper implementation for management, because you know he could have had a lot of connective tissue issues, especially monitoring his eyes and everything so that uh, appropriate intervention and management came into place. So with all this, now if you remember, I showed the slide in the beginning, there was a barrier over here with that custom del dupe. That now goes away, the pipeline is the same, and Cytoscan Exxon uh, is really a very nice complement to whole exome sequencing. In case where you have a suspicion of single genes that, are, that have a, a higher percentage of diagnostic yield associated with it, but other than that also, it is just a very powerful tool for identifying microdeletions, microduplications, and the other things that I've just shown you uh, during this talk. So to summarize, um, you know, all these platforms that we run, one thing that I did not uh, focus on is OncoScan and how we use it. Um, I use OncoScan for a lot of um, multiple um, Referrals. So OncoScan is essentially, again, I explained like, you know, whole exome. So we've got this wonderful platform. I have a slice and dice for melanoma, slice and dice for glioblastoma, slice and dice for renal cell or medulloblastoma in those situations. But one of the things that we have seen in prenatal is that if we have a fetal demise or a product of, of conception, the DNA is of really poor quality. And if the DNA is of poor quality, then we cannot run it on these platforms. But guess what? They run very well on OncoScan. And if we are looking for you know, trisomy, so my first product of conception, it was a double trisomy, trisomy 18 and 22. Because the tissue was so bad that first of all, by the time the, the samples come to us, they are loaded with fungus and stuff like that. They cannot be cultured. And when we isolate the DNA, it's really not of good quality. If we, if we get the tissue in time and we can culture it, then it's fine. But most of the time, 90% of the time, it's culture failure. So in those situations, it's extremely powerful that we've been able to validate and use that. And um, you know, for Cytoscan Exxon, very low input DNA, 100 nanograms, we can run it. Cost effective and efficient. So one of the things that I'm extremely grateful to Thermo is that they, did, they kept this cost neutral. So you pick any of their Cytoscan products, HD or, or uh, Exxon, they kept it cost neutral for us. So no additional burden on the lab. And really lower number of false positive and negative calls. So I'd like to end with, this is the Greenwood Genetic Center staff over here, and this is the cytogenomics lab. And we are all wearing blue. We were celebrating Autism Blue Day. So now I'll take questions. And how do you say thank you? Kupkunka? Did I say that? OK, thank you.